some of you might know that I absolutely adore shadow work embroidery. I often wonder if that mysterious appearance of color behind the veil of fine heirloom fabric were a serendipitous discovery as a result of a mistake, or the needle artist scientifically knew what would happen when all of that thread was multiplied in a confined area. Because so many people love the shadow effect as I do, we have seen the creation of shadow applique and more recently, shadow work stitched on the serger. Today, a mystery or two will be revealed concerning serger shadow work. We have a great show for you, and I think it's time for some aha moments. Thank you for joining me in my sewing room. Absolutely precious are the two words I can think about to describe this little bubble. Oh, how adorable. The first thing I would like for you to look at, do you see how this bodice looks as if someone has done shadow work embroidery by hand? This direction, this direction, all the way across the bodice. The, you know what? It's a trick. This was not done by hand. Believe it or not, this was done by serger. The sweet little sleeves, there's a little piece of Victorian bridging at the bottom of the puff, and the little pink trim, I bet you thought it was ribbon. Well, no, that isn't ribbon, that is a tiny little rickrack. Such a sweet trim. And this edging looks exactly like the $25 a yard kind that you get from Switzerland. However, this beautiful edging was done on an embroidery machine. Look at the cute little bubble, comes down with the little grippers that was so, so sweet. Let's see how easy it is to do this. The first thing you use is either a, now by the way, you've got to use wash away stabilizer. You can use a sticky stabilizer, you know, you pull this piece off and put your fabric to the sticky piece, it's wash away, or an iron on wash away stabilizer, and then you cross it and mark the center and the lines are going in this direction. With a narrow cover stitch on your serger, stitch from top to bottom, all the way over, all the way over, and then to do the cross cover stitching this way, this way, this way. If you will look at this brightly colored pink, these are the stitches from the back. And let me flip it up here and see how pretty it is. That's, after, by the way, that's after the wash away stabilizer has been washed away. Then you see how pretty it is. This is just like magic. Now that sweet little sleeve treatment, the bridging that you would normally run ribbon through has had rickrack run through it. Here is what it looks like with the rickrack threaded through and it is a good idea to use a bodkin to run the rickrack or else a tapestry needle that does not have a point. The little edging that looked like Swiss edging has been made on your embroidery machine absolutely precious, the beautiful little edging, and then of course you trim away from the bottom. I am so pleased to have as my guest today, my very dear friend and business colleague, Peggy Dillbone. Peggy is a sales and education specialist for Husqvarna Viking and a regular contributor to So Beautiful magazine. Peggy, welcome to the show. Hi, Martha, it's great to be here as <laughs> usual. I am going to share that secret with you about oh, cover stitch wonderful. shadow. Isn't it wonderful? <laughs> yeah. Since I don't hand sew, this is the best alternative for me. Okay. First thing, you want to set your serger for cover stitch. And I chose to use the narrow, which means my needles are close together because that actually gives me a narrower, more delicate stitch. I've used a darker thread color in the looper and lighter thread color in the needles. The reason I had to use the stabilizer is because the, with the light batiste that I'm using, the stitch would kind of make it tunnel because of the heaviness. Now I did one other thing that people might not think of to make it shadow more. I put my stitch length at 2.0 rather than at three or three and a half. To do that on our serger, I had to choose another stitch, but We'll give you those techniques. Right. Now, I've started this, and the first thing that we do, of course, is mark the fabric that's been stabilized with the wash away. The wash away stabilizer. Mm -hmm. 
that's the easiest because you don't want to have to pick stabilizer. Oh my goodness, not out of that. <laughs> right. And I'm going to show you a little trick. I've started the stitching, and so I'm going to use the edge of my presser foot as my guideline for my next row of stitching. Because it's best to stitch on and off a of fabric with cover stitch, not to stitch on air, I'm taking my second piece, which would be my right or my left bodice, and I'm just going to butt it right up to this one and stitch right onto that piece. Now that so is I'm a good stitching trick. both okay. at the same time. And you just stitch to the end. Once I'm finished, I just clip the threads. And I would bring this one around and start oh, again. Okay. okay. You really do just stitch them end to end. You I just stitch to end to end. And I just stitch on and keep stitching and keep stitching. This is what the end result would look like. This is with the stabilizer on it, and then I rinse the stabilizer out. This is what the back looks like, and this shadows through. So that's as easy it is as it is. You just cut your bodice out from that. Then for the sleeves, this isn't surging, but this is a great technique for um, sewing. I used my embroidery machine, and this particular embroidery sews an outline of the scallop and then you trim the fabric away from the scallop. It continues with the satin stitch so that when you're finished and you rinse this away, your scallops are already trimmed. And I trimmed it down to the size that I wanted it, gathered it, and attached it to the bridging, which I put the rickrack through because the rickrack, sometimes you can't find ribbons, so I discovered the rickrack looks like little baby hearts. Oh, Peggy, that is the sweetest technique, and thank, thank you so much. And now Peggy has some sewing inspirations for you. Peggy, it's hard to believe that these things are really done on a serger. Absolutely. This precious little day gown out of this butter soft knit. Tell us about this. Is the whole thing done on the serger? Everything but the embroidery. Everything, the, the bind, the bias bind, binding? And yes, the bias binding, and I'm going to share that technique with you. Oh, my goodness. That's Absolutely. a little boy version. And here is the little girl version. Oh, Peggy, this is just so sweet. Thank and you. I love the fact that this, this uh, one piece comes over, therefore the um, embroidery does not touch the baby's skin. Right. And yeah. It has um, a soft interfacing behind there also. That, you that know what? That's it. what you do, even if it yeah. does touch the skin. What a beautiful, beautiful lady's blouse. Tell me this was not all done on the serger. No. It's part not of all it, part done on the serger. Okay. Everything was joined with the serger, just with our favorite heirloom three-thread rolled edge. Everything um, was joined on the serger. Yes, thing. I joined okay. the laces and trims, but the pin tucks are machine pin tucks, and of course, the center embroidery was done with the embroidery machine. Oh, Peggy, and it this goes is beautiful. With, uh, the Swiss embroidery. And this kind of a blouse is so wonderful. I always wear a jacket. This is so wonderful to put under a jacket. Mm -hmm. How cute. Oh, the little ladybugs. Now, oh, you know what? You've used that wonderful weaving the rickrack yeah. through the bridging on this adorable little summer little girl's outfit. You know what? If it were another fabric, you could put a long sleeve t-shirt on it and that would be a winter outfit yes, too. Yes, you could. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Camisoles are one of our very favorite things. Now, I know this has pajama bottoms to go with it. It could be a camisole. Now, is this serger and machine? or most That's of the all serger. All serger. That's all serger. Now, here are the tap pants that go with it. If you would like for it to be pajamas, let me hold the whole thing up. And this is the silk charmeuse? Yes. Oh, Peggy, it just feels like heaven. Doesn't it feels oh, wonderful. Oh, it's wonderful. That's the pajamas, the camisole. And then, you know, one of my favorite things of all things is the now this is a serger quilt this is a serger quilt constructed almost totally by serger all the joining is by serger all the joining and the binding was put on with the serger too oh my goodness and yes. the puffing by serger too puffing by serger oh peggy what a what a treasure for a new baby to have a little blanket I like this know it. and now peggy has a so quick so easy idea to share with you Peggy, that is the cutest baby bib I've ever laid my eyes on. Tell us about it. <laughs> well, 
I just thought I just thought it was cute, Martha. It's got little sleeve caps. There's an armhole opening. It's got the elastic through the back. And let me just turn it over so we flip can see it the back. over. I use piping. this oh. little tab effect on the back to close it, and it was very easy to do. And I did this great little velvet-like embroidery on the front. So and then the little blue one has a turtle. Little oh, blue one has a turtle. Isn't that cute? Cute little diaper top too. Diaper oh, it would shirt. Be, it Not would just be, a bib. It'd be great for summer baby, wouldn't it? Be oh nice and my cool. goodness, yes. Yeah. Well, I'm going to show you uh, the steps that I did and how I did the binding because this was done with the serger. All the binding all the way around. You're going to bind the armholes. There's two little tabs that get sewn on. I put the binding around those with the serger. And of course, did the embroidery first. And this is how the embroidery looks before you cut the top stitches to make it fluff up. It's called velvet? What did it's you say? called thread velvet. Thread velvet. Oh, how yeah. interesting. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. It's so cute. And isn't that little snail cute? <laughs> so once you get the binding on, then you stitch it with your sewing machine and the elastic goes all the way across the back. You attach it at each end and then turn the casing over the elastic and stitch it. And that's all there is to it. Now I want to show you the steps for doing the um, serger binding. And the reason I love this, Martha, is because a serger stitch is perfectly even. It's a perfect quarter inch. So when I turn the binding over, it's even and consistent. But you just serge it on with a four thread overlock, turn half the bias to the edge of the stitching, and then you take it and you turn it over the rest of the way. Perfect. Pin bias. it in place mm -hmm. and then top stitch it. Now, Peggy, that's the fourth. What did you say this is? This is four thread overlock. Okay. It's okay. just the wide four thread stitch. Okay. And it just stitches on perfectly. All right. And then you just turn okay. half the bias and turn it again. Turn it one more time. Turn it one more time. Isn't that great? And I pin, putting the pins in vertical this way from the front side so that when you can look on the back side and you can see that you've actually caught the edge of the bias so you know you have it folded plain. Peggy, that is absolutely fabulous. Thank you so much You're for sharing so that welcome. wonderful technique. And now we have some hand embroidery for you. I'm so pleased to have as my guest today, my friend Sandy Jenkins from Fredericksburg, Texas. That's the hill country in Texas for those of you that know a little bit about Texas. Sandy is a needlework designer of all different types of needlework. She's also now designing machine embroidery. Sandy, welcome to the show. Thank you, Martha. I love teaching, so it's a perfect opportunity. And I thank you for having me. Today, we're gonna do a stitch called Woven Spider. It's not a very common stitch, but one that I think our audience will really enjoy. Um, we're gonna do half a woven spider, and I'll, I brought some models to show you in a moment, but I think we'll do the stitch first. Um, when you do half, you're gonna lay some baseline, you always lay baselines, but on the half, we're gonna lay baselines that are horizontal, okay? And I'm not gonna do a lot of them just because the fact of time-wise, but you'll get the idea, and I think you can find many applications after you learn. You wanna lay these baselines with just a hair of space in between, just enough to see them, to wrap them or weave them. I'm gonna lay three today, just because that's an easy amount. You're going to come up just beside where you began. Doesn't matter on which end, but you will always start on that end every time. I'm not using it today, I have a pointed needle, but I would normally, for a wrapped or woven stitch, I would use a tapestry needle so that it's blunt, okay? I'm going to wrap under each of these baselines that we just laid. I'm gonna wrap under that one. So the first one and the last one will be wrapped alone. Every one after that will be wrapped together with the one you're behind. So I'm gonna wrap that one and one more and then the last one by itself, okay? Then I'm gonna go down on the same side where we began. 
And you want those base lines that we first laid to be rather tight. Okay, I'm going to come up just below where we began and I'm going to wrap the first one alone and I'm wrapping under and that's what creates the little legs. That one and one more, that one and one more and every time you wrap you're going to be pulling those together so that you're mounding or they'll have a little more dimension. The next one you wrap by itself, the last one. And each time you pull them down so that they're all together. Um, if you were doing a circle of these, which would be a whole rate, uh, woven spider, you would lay base lines that are not horizontal, but they would be in a circle. And I'll show you an example of that also. As soon as I get to the end of this one, we'll stop. Even though I would like to pad it a little bit more and do, do it a little extra. My students always want to start stop one short. I always <laughs> want to do an extra. Okay, so we'll go down right behind it. This makes great little legs, like a little feet of a raccoon or some little animal. Now, if we're doing a whole woven spider, or a whole ray spider for that matter, we would lay an X and across as our baselines. And you would just do them as large as the circle that you're covering. Okay, so here we go. And you would start, instead of starting at the end, you will start in the center, okay? So you'd start in the center, and you would wrap over for the smooth or under for the for the um, one that has the little legs. Just go round and round and round until you finish. You don't go down each time for it. Um, the cherries are an example of the ray spider. Here I've done a round, which this would end up being, and it's an example of the woven spider. I brought a couple of models today, Martha. One is of a new hunter's quilt that I'm doing, and the krill is done with a half woven spider, the one that I taught you today. And you can do them as long as you need, just as long as you keep laying more base lines and more base lines. This is done with a linen thread. Martha, there are so many kinds of threads available, you just cannot believe it nowadays. We just have a wealth of threads. Just so much fun to get that texture. This is a great piece. This is the mermaid, and it's in needlepoint. And you know, I often have people say, well, but I don't do needlepoint. Do you know that embroidery is embroidery because it's done on cloth, and needlepoint is embroidery on canvas, that's right. and that's the only difference there is. So this is an example of a raised spider. Remember that it will be smooth. This one is an example of a woven spider, the shell. And doesn't that just make great little legs of that shell? It's just perfect. And I, I just think this is such a wonderful stitch. This is an example of a half where you'll go from side to side. This is an example of a round so that you would continue to wrap all the way around. This one, your thread going over. This one, your thread going under. Sandy, I'm just so thrilled that you've shared that with our viewers today. It's always a pleasure to have you here, and I just love and you. I just love this fishing. Thank and you're you. right; there is practically nothing to embroider for me, and I no. think this is the a, a Christmas present for us to do next year. It's a perfect thing. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sandy. Thank you. And now I have some machine embroidery to share with you. I'm so pleased to have as my guest today, my dear friend, Denise Applegate Schober. Denise is with Cactus Punch. Denise, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Martha. Oh, this beautiful skirt. Now, let me just show our viewers that it's a beautiful, long, uh, bias cut skirt. What I'm really going to do is show this incredible embroidery that goes all the way down to the very bottom. Denise, let's start from the bottom of this skirt and tell us how you did this. The skirt the length was determined by three repeats of the design. So before I hemmed it, I did the first embroidery and then finished the hem. Cut out the cut work section okay. on that first one only, and then went up to do the next section. Okay, and then you did the next section. Did you mirror image it? Something? I did, mirror okay. image from okay. end to end. Oh, so and then pretty. the final one is mirror imaged again where it lands right at the little embellishment piece at the top. You did such a beautiful job. You're such a good tailor. All right, go ahead, Denise, and talk to us. Well, we're going to talk about needles, Martha. So the skirt is a bias skirt, but it's also a linen. 
and the linen fabric, you want to use a fine needle. So let's go over here to our needles, Martha, and we'll talk about our needles. You have many varieties of needles. You have jeans needles and jerseys, which are knit needles. You have a multi-pack needle that might have all the different style needles that you need in it. And then there's embroidery needles, but not always do we need to use an embroidery needle. If I was doing a denim that had a lot of starch in it, I would use a denim needle. And on the skirt, I actually used a Microtech 7010 Sharp because of the finer fabric. Also, you want to make sure your bobbins are the same weight as your top thread, especially like on the linen. And then this, this little device here is a circular device, and it allows you to pick the type of fabric that you're going to sew on. So let's say we'll move it to a light knit. The light knit tells us now in this little size that we're going to use a 7011 needle and it tells us what point of the needle. So it's a great little device to help us pick the right needle for what and we're needles doing. needles are so important. Oh yes, needles are extremely important. Now, here we embroidered our own freestanding lace. And with that, you're going to use a water-soluble stabilizer. Well, sometimes the water-soluble stabilizer is a little dense, and sometimes it's not. So depending on the type of water-soluble stabilizer, your needle's going to change. This is like a fabric water-soluble stabilizer. So I used a, a embroidery needle that was a 70 or 75 embroidery needle, and then it all washes away. Okay. So easy to make lace. Make sure you use the right needle. The last one I'd like to show is this collar. These are pieces of a collar on silk. So we have silk on the machine and we definitely want to use a light needle with that. And the needle also depends on the thread size. So if you have a larger size thread, you're going to use a larger eyed needle. Do you know something? And changing, how often do you change needles when you do machine embroidery? Usually after every project. Now the skirt, I actually changed it after each section because there were so many stitches in that, I changed it quite often. So you know, three Denise, times. Denise, that's what, that's what my advice is and what everyone is advising. Change those needles. They're not expensive and you really don't want to have a beautiful project go kafui in the middle of the project because of a bird needle. Yes, yeah, so you can ruin your fabric faster than oh, you could heavens, changing that needle. It, it just absolutely is critical. Denise, thank you so much. Thanks, Martha. And now I'm going to share a piece from my vintage collection with you. This little baby day gown has some very interesting sewing features, and one is the design of the front and the design of the back. I'm going to show you what I mean. The front has a little round yoke with the gathers below and some beautiful little Swiss embroidery. I think this piece must have been made like this for use in this type of dress. Then we go down to the bottom and we have insertion and some little tiny tucks and a sweet little gathered ruffle with lace on the bottom. Now what is so interesting about the construction, let me turn it around for you. You saw the front had the round yoke and the back has a V or a square yoke. It's very unusual to find a round on the front and a V yoke on the back. The back has some really sweet little pin tucks in sets of three, two little buttons and buttonholes, and once again the little ruffle around the bottom. Don't you think that's interesting though with a completely different front design and a completely different back design? I loved it when I found that little gown. Many times when I'm looking for antique clothes now, it has to have something very unique in the way of sewing. There was a time when I just bought everything I found, but now I have quite a collection. I have a letter from Linda Sapp of New Mexico. Linda Sapp of New Mexico has a passion for personalized pillowcases. Each November and December, she gets the names and a few words on the interests of the children who need a little extra something at the holidays. By combining the perfect novelty fabric and her embroidery machine, she makes approximately 100 pillowcases for various agencies each year. To date, about 500 children in foster care in two towns, two Christian children's homes, children of military members, kids on the angel tree, and even active duty members serving in Iraq have gotten a personal gift to match their interests. Thank you, Linda, for your work. Thank you for joining me in my sewing room today. Please come back to see me next time.